You're now listening to the Rogue Ones podcast, conversations with extraordinary people doing fascinating things that will encourage us to live with a bend toward the remarkable. Today, you'll meet a rogue lawyer who is two years into his very own startup law firm. We talk discipline versus passion, and the takeaways are good for anyone in literally any area of interest. Welcome to the Rogue Ones podcast series. I'm Leslie Eiler Thompson, and today's episode is for the entrepreneurs out there, especially creative entrepreneurs, struggling with balancing their creativity and channeling that into tangible goals. This episode's guest, Justin Sievert, could be considered a rogue lawyer. The firm that he owns with his business partner launched two years ago and essentially functions as a startup. The practice works with small to medium-sized businesses with an emphasis in sports and fitness fields. In this conversation, we talk about setting priorities, how to balance parenting with a career, and embracing failure without embarrassment. I love that part of our talk. In addition to his rogue lawyering, he's a national strongman competitor, which is how my husband and I came to meet him several years ago, but most of his law peers don't know this about him. This made for an interesting delve into why and how it plays out in his interactions with coworkers and clients. Most of your law people don't know that you're a strongman person, which is hysterical to me because that was like the first way that we came to know you was through that. What do people think when you first tell them that you are that or, or, or do you tell them? I don't really ever volunteer it. Like I was in my office the other day and I went to, I went to lunch with a couple of guys who, who have offices right next to me and they were, they were talking about fitness and nutrition and I really just keep my mouth shut when it comes to those things. I kind of like to separate parts of my life probably. Now that we're doing work with more fitness industry clients, it kind of melds together a little bit more just because it's a good, it's a good marketing tool to say, Hey, I know your industry, not just as a lawyer, but also as somebody who participates actively in it and kind of in, understands kind of what, what you're doing on a day in day out basis, not just the, the legal aspects of it. How did you get into the world of strongman? Have you moved past the amateur level at this point? Like you are a professional? No. So what does that look like? So I was a, I was an athlete throughout my life. Um, in high school, I played football, track and field, uh, baseball and wrestling. And in college, I was a football player, and I was also a, a track and field athlete. And then once I graduated, I coached for a few years before I went to law school, but I didn't really compete in anything at that point. So I was kind of was done with that aspect of my life, at least for the time being. I was just kind of ready to take a break because I always took it so seriously as a when I was younger and then through college that I just kind of needed a break. And then probably I still worked out and things like that. And then probably in 2010 I think I I I was just kind of searching around looking at like some some workout articles online then I came across a a guy in Rhode Island who had uh his own home gym and he had all the strongman equipment and I was like oh that'd be that'd be fun to try so I sent him an email and I started going there you know like on Saturdays just for like an hour or two just really messing around, not really anything organized. Didn't and where geographically or anything like that. were you at this point, if you were going to Rhode Island? I was I was working at Brown University okay. in Rhode Island. So it was before I moved back down to Florida um, and before I got married. So so I, I kind of started there. And then when I moved back down to Florida, I saw a, a competition, a very local competition at a, at a college down here that was, it was basically a fundraiser and I competed there. And I had fun. And then I met some people there and they were having a bigger competition the next weekend. So I did that competition. <laughs> and then I kind of discovered kind of where people trained for strongman in South Florida. And I was pretty fortunate to have, there's a pro heavyweight strongman, Heath Allison, who's down here. I guess I've been competing ever since. So you are, you are a lawyer with your own firm. Is that the right? Yes, we have. We have. It's myself and my partner have a law firm. We started It'll actually be two years ago next month, so we're hey. we're just about to our two year anniversary, and the doors are still open. So that's there you always go. a good thing. I know that so, is yeah. a great thing. So when did you first? I know your your undergrad is in poli sci, right? But then you had a 
You got a master's degree in education? Yeah, so I went to I went to Union College in New York with the goal of being a doctor. I took pre med courses and did all that. That was kind of my path, what I wanted to do from high school. Um, and then I took uh, chemistry in college, <laughs> and that didn't go so well. And I was kind of just like, <laughs> this isn't really, this isn't really for me. And I was at a liberal arts school, so it's not really a school that's designed to give you a job. It's a school that's designed to educate you on, sure, you know nonsense kind of um but it, it's it kind of puts you in a position <laughs> oh, where no. you're not necessarily learning anything applicable but it is teaching sure. you how to think which is probably sure. the more important skill because i mean you, you see it now jobs are changing rapidly and what they require and what you learn today may not be applicable in five years anyway so it's better to learn how to think um than just learn a specific trade really in a lot of professions so i switched over to political science and i graduated in 2003 and I guess during my junior year, I decided I was going to take the LSAT, which is the entrance examination for law school. So I took I took the LSAT, did pretty well on it, and I started to apply to schools. Um, so I, I ended up getting into a few different schools, and I had my mind set. I was going to go to Albany Law School, which was right by – it was basically Union College is their law school. Okay. Um, so I set my deposit in there. I was I went looking for apartments um, with with one of my best friends from from college who I played football with at Union, and we found a place and it was great. It was a really nice place in downtown Albany, and I was like, okay. So we we decided to go to lunch, and during lunch, we were gonna we basically were gonna go to lunch and then pay our deposit after lunch. During lunch, I had a, I kind of you know was thinking about it a little bit more, and we got back from lunch, called the apartment place, and it was booked. They had reserved uh -uh. that apartment <gasps> over lunch. Over lunch. And. I was basically like, I don't know if I'm ready to go yet. So basically, if I wouldn't have went to lunch at that like at that time, if I would have called before, I probably would have went to law school. You know, two years later, then ended up going. Wow. So I changed my mind. I had a few different offers to coach at the collegiate level: a couple in football, a couple in track and field. So I went up to St. Lawrence University, and I was a graduate assistant track and field coach for two years. So I got my master's in education for free, and I spent two years up there. It's very cold. It's basically five minutes away from Canada. And I was kind of like, you know, I think I'm ready to go to law school now. And I applied to again to a bunch of schools. And Miami was one of the schools I got into. And it was a lot different than St. Lawrence um, in yeah, terms of just bit. weather and kind of what I had going on. And I was ready for kind of a change and to be in a big city. And I ended up going, going to Miami. Um, what about those two years made you recalibrate and think about you wanting to go to law school again? I just don't think I was ready to make a commitment to something that serious and that intense. You know, I mean, it's a big decision to it's law school is very expensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, the, the student loan debt, I, my wife and I pay on a monthly basis is, is not, not exciting. Um, <laughs> because she's also a lawyer too. She is also a lawyer and the much smarter person in our family. Hopefully at some point I can retire early based on her success. That would be, that would be ideal. Um, then I can stay in strongman full time, but, there uh, you go. no, but so I wasn't ready to make that commitment. Um, so I just figured, you know, there's, there's nothing that says I have to do this right now. Um, I loved I loved track and field, and I had the opportunity to coach some people who I had com actually competed against during during my career, and they were hmm. kind of on the verge of doing some really good things, making nationals at at, our, at the NCAA level, and I really wanted to help them and kind of also kind of make sure I was making the right decision. So that's that's why I went, and it was a great experience. I mean, being up there was probably two of the best years of my life. I really loved being up there. I mean, people always say, "Well, it's in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing to do." But that kind of fits my personality a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I liked just kind of the quietness of it and to go fishing and to just kind of be able to focus on the things I was interested in without, you know, the hustle and bustle around me. Um, so it was a really good opportunity and I'm glad I did it. But after two years, I was, you know, it was kind of ready to, is this what you're going to do for the rest of your life or are you going to do something different? And the law degree to me wasn't necessary. I didn't necessarily go to law school to be a lawyer at that time. I really just wanted to continue to work in college athletics and I was hoping to be an administrator, um, kind of try oh. to move up to the, the athletic director's role. And that's actually what I did when I left law school. I worked at my alma mater for a year, basically in an entry level position. I made probably 20% of what all my classmates were making in terms of salary because I took an <laughs> entry level college administrator job. I was making... I think like 20,000 a year. 
Oh my um, gosh. And I was working probably 15 hour days because I was coach. I, I coached again. Basically what I, what I pitched to them was let me take this coaching position. And in turn, I want experience doing all these different things. So I coached, but then I also worked with their, worked on the athletics budget side of things, working with all the programs to, to plan and maintain budgets. I worked on the compliance side of things. I ran the varsity athletic weight room. I did strength and conditioning for like three or four teams. I took MBA classes so I wouldn't have to pay my student loans. So, I mean, I was working. I mean, I would get up and start probably 5.30 a.m. and I'd probably get home at 9.30, 10 at night. Mm-hmm. And that was just how it was all year. And then from there, I went to Brown University and I was there for a year. And at that time, I was dating my then girlfriend, now wife. And it was kind of a situation where I was in Rhode Island. She was still in in Florida practicing law. Which is where you guys met in Miami. Yep. We met at Miami. So one of us kind of had the, if we were, if we were serious, there was going to be, there's obviously a point where either I needed to go down there or she needed to come to where I was. When you're a lawyer at a big law firm and she's at a big law firm, there's kind of a a set path that you need to go. If you want to make partner someday, then you have to build up in a very a regular track to that to that ultimate goal. So she kind of had that on one hand. On the other hand, I really believe in her as mm-hmm. a professional. I think she's a phenomenal a phenomenal lawyer, both in terms of the actual skill set of practicing law and also the soft competencies in terms of being able to work with other people of varying backgrounds, um, work with clients. I think she's a rock star in a profession. If she's going to take advantage of that skill set, and it's what she really loves to do, then it was more important for me to kind of take a step back and not necessarily follow follow the path that I would have scripted for myself, but to kind of make sure I, I provided her the opportunity mm-hmm. to, to do, do those things. And I mean, I think as well, there's the whole issue of professional timing, I think, for men and women in terms of just one one gender, one sex can have children and the other can't. Mm-hmm. So that's always a part of it too. And we know we, we, we wanted to have a family. So it was important that I think she had those years to really develop and not have that. I don't want to say interrupted because that's not how you should look at having a child, but right, sure. it adds another dimension to her need to be successful. So I ended up going down to Miami in 2000 and. 10. I ended up working at a law firm down there that actually practiced in the college sports industry. And I was there for a few years. And then she got a job offer in Nashville and we got married and moved to Nashville. I think she moved two weeks later. I stayed down in Florida, sold our house and I moved up, I think four months after that. And wow. we were in Nashville for, for three years. And yeah. So that's what a kinda, culture shock. I mean, going it, from like, you basically bounced between New York and Florida for a number of years. And then you ended up kind of in the middle in the proper South, which, you know, Florida is like literally South, but, but that's, was, it's not like South, South. And I was born in Iowa and I grew and up in Michigan. That. So I've been kind of everywhere. <laughs> was that a military family and, or was it something else? Retail family. So Retail my dad family. worked, yeah, my dad worked for JC Penney's, um, oh, growing JC up. Oh, JC Penney. Yep. So we, so we kind of moved around as his career advanced. I probably went to seven or eight different schools growing up. How do you so think moved. that helped you in where you are now with career and all of that? I think it helps in terms of, I never really, because I don't have necessarily like a, a, a home city, mm-hmm. I'm, I, I'm pretty comfortable wherever I am. Um, in terms of, I'm used to different things. I'm used to different cultures, different types of people, especially, I think one of the big things was, so as my father's career advanced, I was also, our family's financial profile changed as well. So I was also, Mm -hmm. you know, and not just in terms of like geographic differences, but, you know, socioeconomic differences as well. I was just, I had the opportunity to, to just kind of get to know different types of people. And I think that's very beneficial. And I think the other thing was a lot of times we'd move move after the school year, so that means I was spending the summer in a new place where I really didn't know anybody. So I got very comfortable. I'm very comfortable being by myself and also being in groups. So I think those are the, probably the two biggest things is just exposure to different types of people. And also you kind of, you have to be comfortable with yourself if you're going to spend mm. time alone, especially as a kid, I think. Right. You know, it's. You know? Um, I think what's interesting about the practice of law is... 
and I'm sure you all hate this, but all of the all of the Netflix shows, you know, have made us all true crime experts. Yep. You see, so I'm I also <laughs> am an expert, just like you, in the ways of law. But it's fascinating <laughs> to watch them work with these people that are quirky and strange, and and they have to both give credence and validity to their client, um, but also navigate very difficult situations with them. Yeah, I mean, the types of clients you deal with are always different. I mean, one one thing with, with us is we don't really do litigation. I mean, our practice is more based around working in the sports industry or working with entrepreneurs and startups and businesses that are kind of at the stage where they're really ready to make, this, make that next step. Um, you know, businesses with five to 15 employees. Like that's kind of the type of business we work with outside of the sports industry practice. And we're dealing with how can we help this business grow and grow efficiently, make sure they're staying in the black and just really how can we help them build? How can we help them build what they want to do and like build not just their business, but like, I mean, everybody goes into business because not just because the business itself, because they probably also value how that could impact them on a personal level if the business works. Yeah. You know, people, ha- you know, it's just, it just, it affects all areas of their life. So we're really, we look at ourselves more as, as builders mm. than dispute resolvers. So we're doing transactional work. Um, we're doing employment work with their business. We're doing an intellectual property work. We're doing, we're helping them form their businesses. Um, we're helping figure out how to finance those businesses. We're mm-hmm. looking at all of those things. So we're really looking at things that how can we make this business grow and be sustainable and how yeah. can we help them rather than they have a dispute with another with a client or another business. Now, we, we've done litigation. We can do litigation. It's just not really what we're looking to do. Right. Um, Is that the space you've always been in um, after you came out of the educational academic space? When you first, because I think you were at a firm that you left in 2015, but was that the kind of stuff you were doing there too? Our practice there was 95% college sports work. So basically what we did there was a lot different. Like I said, 95% college sports work. And what that entailed at that firm was NCAA enforcement work, which is really, we were representing schools and coaches when they would get in trouble with the NCAA. We also did a lot of just proactive work from an NCAA compliance level, and we also did some Title IX work as well in terms of athletics equity. Not in terms, we didn't do the sexual assault portion of it, but we did. We did, you know, our male and female students being treated under the athletics department. That's what we were looking at, and that's actually one of the reasons I ultimately decided to leave and do my own thing was because I I like that being part of what I do, but I wanted to do just more. I wanted to do more work on the transactional side than I was doing, both in sports and out of sports. And I also wanted to work with businesses who I felt were a lot like the law firm that Dan and I ultimately created. Hmm. You know, I think we're, I mean, we're a law firm, but we're also a startup. Yeah. We're, right. we're, on, we're entrepreneurs just as much as, you know, a tech company right. or a marketing company. It's the same thing. We all have the same issues we want to make more work hopefully like less on the stuff we don't want to do and you know just like live a flexible lifestyle where we can do the things we want and pay for the lives we want to live um and help other businesses like us succeed Mm -hmm. so i was looking to kind of move more in that direction and you know we've been really fortunate i think to be able to do that the past two years i love the idea of you guys saying that you are a startup because you are, you're starting your own thing. This Mm -hmm. is kind of your first um, thing that you've started, right? And you said you've learned a lot. What do you think is the main thing that you've learned in these almost two years of starting this firm? I think the what you really learn as a new business is really trying your best to ride the highs and the lows Mm. as evenly as possible because I mean, I think anybody who's a year or two into a business, there's months where you're like, we've made it. This is it. This is really, this is great. Like I have great clients, great, interesting work. They pay well and everything is great. And then there's months where it's like, wow, it's, it got slow all of a sudden. And I think it's tough when you're a small, when you're just starting out because it's hard to scale. 
So you might be really, really busy, but usually when you're really busy, you're not probably doing the business development aspects of your, of your business for those next clients, at least as much as you were when you're not as busy. So once that work ends, maybe there's not as much coming down to play. And then, you know, it's, if it's not like a regular job where, you know, I'm going to get paid every month, regardless, if you're not bringing in the business, no paychecks come in either. So, so that's, so I think it's riding those highs and lows and being consistent with what you need to do on a regular basis. So even if you don't think you have time to do that business development work to really run your firm and your business administratively in terms of, you know, payroll or making sure you're keeping track of your, your, your reimbursements or it's, it's just one of those things where you need to schedule time to do those things regardless of how busy you are. And when you're not that busy, you can't to the best of your ability to say, oh my gosh, this is the end of the world. I'm not going to be able to, <laughs> where I'm never going to get another client again because there's going to be highs and lows. And even when I talk to people who have been lawyers at big law firms for decades, even they have slow times. You mm. never really, when you're, when you have your own business, you're, you never, you're never going to be in a situation probably where you're not going to have some, some bad times, you know, and you just need to navigate those as best you can. I know that feeling so well. And at the very beginning, there was a lot of, um, of course, I, I am an emotional person, not not mm-hmm. super crazy emotional. I'm not always breaking down and crying or anything. Um, but I do love a good cry every once in a while. And I do love a good run around in the field singing and twirling every once in a while too. What are the things that you have found that help you navigate through those in, in your own way that kind of keep you focused? I think just, and I'm not, I'm by no means an expert at doing this. I think that's one of the things that I struggle with is always being even keel. Um, cause I think, I think anybody, it's hard not to get stressed out about your business when things aren't great. And it's hard not to be overly confident when it's going really well. What I, what I really try to work towards is having a schedule, being really disciplined in my approach to my, my practice. I do a pretty good job of like, here's, here's my goals for the year. Here's my calendar of how I'm going to do things based on, you know, a month, the day I'm very, very regimented in that regard. And it kind of helps me on stay on the right path, regardless of kind of where, where the business is, because at the end of the day, you can't be, you know, woe is me, this isn't working. And then just sit there and not do anything about it. You can maybe have a five or 10 minute period where you're just like, where you have that little freak out, but you got to come right back and put it into work and say, okay, here's what I was going to do today and, and do it regardless of what the circumstances are, because you're not going to solve the problem by standing still mm-hmm. and, wor- and worrying about it. You can worry, but you still have to put it into work and really do what's necessary to, to solve the problem. Do you think that's something that uh, your sports background and maybe even your current activity, your strongman activity taught you through the years, even before you were in any sort of professional space. Was that a constant sort of reminder to you, put in the work, do the practice, you know? Yeah, I think so. Because I think one of the things that sports teaches you, um, especially individual sports is, is if you put in the work, you're going to make progress. It might not always be that perfect, you know, line up and to the right. You see with financial projections, like that kind of thing, you have to add the attitude of if I put in the time, results are going to follow. They may not follow in the time frame that you want them to follow. They may be a little bit slower than you want at times. They may be too fast at times where you're not ready to have as much success as you're having. It can come both ways. So I think that's, you know, one of the things that athletics is very good at doing And then I think the other thing is just having the attitude of why not you? Why can't you be the one who's successful? Why can't you be the one who's doing something in your industry? Because obviously we all, we, we all have a, our own business for one reason or another. And it's usually something along the lines of, I think I can do something in this industry. That's a little bit different. I think I can do it better. I think I can do it at a better price. I think I can provide a better service or better communication and having that attitude of, well, why, why can't it be me? Why can't Mm -hmm. I be successful and just believing yourself? And I think, when you're successful in anything like athletics or you're actress in singing space, you, that, that should be able to transfer to business where you mm-hmm. show like, okay, if I do X, Y, and Z, then likely results are going to follow sure. at some point. 
I'll get back to my conversation with Justin Sievert in a moment. Next, we tackle failure. I think you'll be surprised by what he says, and I know you're going to walk away with something to think about. If this is your first time listening to this show, welcome. There are more episodes just like this one where I talk to people going rogue and ask them about their failures, opportunities, and insecurities. We get down to the nitty gritty, and remarkable people like yourselves tend to appreciate that honesty. Check out previous episodes and find more at rogueonespodcast.com. Now, back to the episode with Justin, where we discuss everyone's favorite topic, failure. Here we go. I want to talk about failure because a lot of the people who listen to this podcast are younger, I guess is a good way to put it. And and we're in a stage of of trying things and failing most of the time. We feel like we're failing. How has failure played a part in your your career and even your sports career and all the things? I mean, I, I, I fail all the time. You can't really care. Like, you can't let it affect you. What are you going to accomplish if, one, you're scared to fail, and two, if you, like, take it to heart and let it impede your progress? You don't need to be successful right away, and you don't need to be successful all the time. And I think failure is also a good opportunity to kind of reflect on what you are doing and trying to try to tweak it and make it better. I know there's been times in my legal career where, you know, I've wanted to, you know, get a certain client and never been able to get that client or never been able to just kind of push that relationship as far as I wanted to. And, you know, that can be tough. I know when I was first coming out of law school, I applied to a lot of jobs and I got turned down by a ton of places and that's mm-hmm. fine. Like it, it happens to everybody. So I think you just can't, you can't take it to heart. Do you ever get in, not that you should be, but do you ever, do, do you feel embarrassment? And if you do, how do you, or how have you conditioned yourself to not be embarrassed? I think a lot of people fail and they're, they're so just, I'll speak personally for myself. I'm embarrassed every time I try something and it doesn't work. The reality is, is like most people don't care that you mm-hmm. failed. Like the people who actually, who you, whose opinion you actually care about, like they don't care. They're like happy that you tried something and gave it your best shot and put in the work towards it. And they're probably confident in you that you're going to succeed at some point anyway. People who are going to like either make fun of you or point out your failures, like it's probably because they are failures and they're doing nothing about it. So you just can't care. Hmm. Like what's the, like, why does it, like, what does it matter? Like what, what, what did, you know, I think Michael Jordan's quote was you miss a hundred percent of the shots that you don't take. So not to get overly sportsy, but that's, that's true. And that's, and he talked about all the time, all the game winning shots that he missed and nobody remembers those. Like everybody remembers him as the best basketball player that ever lived and probably the best right. athlete that ever lived. And that guy failed all the time. Right. And look at look at like baseball players. You go into the Hall of Fame by hitting 300, meaning you got to hit 30% of the time. So you're basically failing potentially 70% of the time in your right. sport. And you're the best in the world. You're a, you're <laughs> a hall, you're a, you're a best of all time in your sport and you're failing 70% of the time. You can't worry about it. I think you should take lessons from it. Mm. And maybe there's things you could do differently. Successful people, I think, fail a lot because they're mm. willing to take shots because they have big goals. Mm. People who don't fail a lot tend to not really be pushing themselves. You so know? the encouragement there is if you are failing, that means you're trying and that means you're yeah. pushing yourself further. Exactly. Everybody fails. I don't think you can really develop yourself as a person and develop the skill sets you want to develop unless you have some trial and error because mm-hmm. you don't know really the best way to do things at the start. Whenever you're starting a business, there's a lot of things you're going to probably try to do that just don't work. Mm-hmm. Um, it's always going to be probably a little bit different of a vision than you would initially have. You should constantly be looking at just ways to evolve your yourself and your, your business in that, in that capacity. Do you struggle with uh, any insecurities on a daily basis within business or within? I think whenever you want to accomplish something, you're always wondering whether you're, whether you're doing enough and also how that's, impacting other areas of your life because I think you have to have some sort of balance like I know myself I want my business to be really successful I also want to make sure that I'm spending enough time with my kids we have two little boys five and five and two Um, I want to make sure I'm also having some time for myself and the things that I'm interested in and there's only 24 hours in a day so it's like how do you how do you balance and prioritize those things so if there's any insecurities I have is just 
am I focusing too much on one thing or, or not something? Am I, you know, am I doing the things that I should be doing in terms of living the life I want to live this, this, that kind of stuff. And just finding a good balance and making sure you're, you're dedicated to you're you're as dedicated as you can be into the things that you, that are important to you. You Um, bring up your two little boys and you've talked about, um, how your wife is kind of the superstar, uh, working a lot. So I, I want to talk to the listeners who have kids. We're living in an era where men are, fortunately, it, it's more culturally acceptable for them to be very present in their children's lives. Mm-hmm. And that's something that's very important to you. It's evident. Where did you learn how to how to balance all of that? And, and um, how do you manage this, this work-life balance as your wife is working full-time? If you care about your kids, you're going to want to be present in their life. So I think to me, it's just a matter of, I want them to grow up with me in their lives. So as an entrepreneur, as somebody who has his own business, I'm going to structure my schedule the best I can to prioritize and balance various the, ver- the needs of the various people in my life. So like yesterday, for example, I stopped working at 430 and I went to the grocery store and me and the boys made pizza for dinner. And then we made cookies because I wanted to like spend, I felt like I hadn't spent as much time with them the week prior due to some work commitments. So I wanted to make sure I was spending that time with them. And the good thing is like with most of the time, the work I do, like a lot of times I'll do that and then I'll go back and do work later at night once they're in Mm -hmm. bed. So I think Mm -hmm. it's just a matter of prioritizing things and just being, being disciplined and scheduled in terms of how you approach your work and how you approach your family. Prioritization is so important because there's actually a lot of work in that. That's not an easy thing to do. I think a lot of musicians have these really big dreams of stardom and that's very abstract. You can't just be at stardom, but, but once you break it down to say, actually, I'd like to sing with uh, an orchestra is what I want to do. And once you break Mm -hmm. that down, suddenly it becomes a lot more palatable uh, to eat. You can say, okay, well then I need to find orchestras and maybe it's not that I want to play with the, the Boston pops orchestra. Maybe I can do it in my own you know, my own town where I am and in organizations around me, but that takes work. And I think, uh, people like to follow abstract dreams instead of taking the time to realize what, 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 how are those dreams tangible? But it takes a lot of work to know what those priorities even are. Yeah. I think, you know, one of the big things that I always, I always see, especially with entrepreneurs and new businesses and, just people who are kind of looking to fulfill their dreams is they're like, Oh, I'm really, I'm really passionate about, you know, X, Y, or Z. And it's usually, I'm really passionate about the end result. That's really what it comes down to. And like you're Mm -hmm. saying, there's a lot of steps that you need to take to get to whatever your passionate result is. And you don't get there through passion. You get there through discipline Mm -hmm. because with any job, you're going to be passionate about some things and other aspects, you're going to hate. There's a lot of times I, I like the business development aspect of the law firm. I hate doing the administrative aspect, but all of those things are necessary to do. Just like what you're talking about with, say, a, a, a singer, you know, maybe you love to perform, but you're not willing to market yourself or go out and try to get engagements those types of things or, you right. know, put it, put, put together your website or put together your social media profile. So like you can't just not do those things because you're not passionate about it. Cause then your ultimate goal, you're never going to get there because you're only doing the things you like to do. You have right. to look at what the end result is and do the things that you want to do and also do the things that are necessary, whether you want to do them or not. And that's so to me, dis- so, discipline is what matters. Not passion is important. You shouldn't do something that you have no passion about at all. But discipline is also ultimately what's going to get you from point A to point B because it's going to kind of bring everything together. I love that you said that. I don't know if you watched the Academy Awards Sunday night. I actually thought of you in this conversation because um, Lady Gaga won uh, Song of the Year for her yep. song in A Star Is Born. But what she said, and I printed this out and I wanted to say it during an interview because she said, if you have a dream, fight for it. There's a discipline for passion. And it's not about how many times you get rejected or fall down or beaten up. 
it's about how many times you stand up and are brave and you keep on going. And she said that and you had sent, you know, your questions back to me. And one of the things you said was discipline over passion. And I like freaked out because here's Lady Gaga, this ultimate creative person who is mm-hmm. kind of everything that anyone who wants to sing or songwrite or, or act or anything, she's doing all of it. And, and yet she's saying the same thing. And this is, these are the sorts of conversations that I love having because it brings worlds together. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can, like I said before, you can be super passionate about something and have this great dream, but if you're not willing to say, okay, what are the steps I need to take to get to that, to, to make progress? Like, where are you really, where are you really going to go with it? And mm-hmm. that's why you, I think you see a lot of times people who are, if you're more likely to me to succeed if you're less talented, but disciplined and organized and you are, if you're super talented, but just have no, no idea kind of what direction you're going because that talent, how is that talent really going to be used to its, to its fullest? It's, it's right. just not. How I'd like to kind of wrap up is just with the final question for someone who's looking to live a life of extraordinary measures like yourself. Um, what's the best piece of advice you can give? Number one, figure out the things that are most important to you and prioritize those things. If your priorities are our family and a certain success in the professional world, figure out what, what you need to do to make those things successful in your life. You know, how do you need to balance those things? Have a plan, be disciplined about your approach. I think the, the last part we talked about, and that's the discipline aspect is really the key. If you're trying to do something that's unique and different than what normal people would do in sense of just going to a company and having a job, then you need to not just have a goal or a vision. You need to have a plan and you need to be able to execute that plan and you need to be able to measure how you're executing it and revisit that and see where you need to tweak it. It's just like in with, with sports, really, you're not going to go into a, like a, a game and not have a game plan of how to attack your opponent's weaknesses and to score and to win, it's just like in, that's just same thing with, with business. I mean, if you want your business to be successful, figure out where the, the room is for you to be successful. And I think that can only be done through discipline, through research, through understanding, you know, whatever industry you're in, and then just figuring out what you need to do to, to kind of accomplish those things. So really just prioritization and discipline are, are to me, the, the biggest things to be, to be successful and somebody starting mm-hmm. out. And that, and then again, going back to one of the other things we talked about is not, not worrying about the failures, mm-hmm. not, not worrying about, you know, the things that you don't necessarily know really well. I mean, obviously we, we all advance and you become better at the things we do as our careers kind of go on. And I think most people always live in that fear of one, as you were saying before failure, but the other thing I think people are scared of is just making mistakes. And, yeah. you know, I think a lot of times you're not going to make those mistakes. You usually know more than you think you do about whatever you're doing. You just also know what you don't know. So you have this like kind of fear that you, maybe you're not cut out to do what you're supposed to do. Maybe somebody else could do it better. And you can't worry about that because the fact that you're actually thinking that means you're probably better off than somebody who thinks they know everything because they're too dumb to realize that they don't. Having this conversation brought me a wealth of encouragement, and I hope it did you. So keep fighting the good fight, Rogue One. I think you know exactly what you're doing. I'm glad you joined us today, and if you enjoyed yourself, why don't you smash that subscribe button, leave a review, and follow along with the podcast on Instagram at Rogue One's Podcast. Thanks to Justin for sharing his wisdom. Thanks to Ryan Swinehart at Sick Island Studios here in Music City, USA for mixing and mastering this episode. And thanks to you for taking the time to listen. So be well. We'll talk soon. Bye.